Coming up next on American Black Journal, our series on the Black Church in Detroit examines the impact of COVID-19 on ministers and on their congregations. We're going to hear the stories of loss and grief caused by the pandemic and talk about vaccine hesitancy in the African-American community, plus a look at the Black Church's role in alleviating this public health crisis. Don't go away. American Black Journal starts right now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, Impact at Home, UAW Solidarity Forever, and viewers like you, thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm your host, Stephen Henderson. And as always, I'm really glad you've decided to join us. Today, we're continuing our series on the Black Church in Detroit, which is produced in partnership with the Ecumenical Theological Seminary and with the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Today, we're looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the Black Church and the role of faith leaders during the pandemic. The coronavirus has really devastated communities of color with a disproportionate number of black and brown people dying from this horrible disease. In addition to comforting their parishioners, many faith leaders have also had to face their own personal grief and loss. Producer Marcus Green has the story. Faith is the thing. Um, I always reflect on like what the apostle Paul talks about this uh, weight of glory that is like on the inside. Like, I feel like that has been the thing, which is really faith, the faith that we have in terms of uh, greater is he that's in us, right? That that has been the thing that really has allowed me to put one foot in front of the other ever since April 9, which was the, the day that my mom passed away. I uh, preached a funeral for uh, the daughter of one of my neighbors at a local a church. The funeral was packed. And uh, at that time, uh, we were told uh, by the White House that, uh, and other uh, authorities, wash your hands, don't touch your face, and that was it. Somewhere along that line, I caught COVID. And didn't, wasn't quite sure what it was, but what happened was, um, uh, my wife, who was caring for me, she also caught it. And on April 9th of last year, she died from it. My daughter and I were not able to attend my wife's funeral. So when my wife was taken by ambulance to, to San Agres Hospital, I, I, I never saw her again. Uh, she left the house. I was sick. I crawled to the window to see uh, the ambulance taking her away. And I never saw her again, never talked to her again. You know, where you minister to other people, when they go through challenges, you know, when they've lost family members, well, this time around, it was, I was that person in that seat. And so I still am, but even during those times, those months after my mom passed, um, there was still a congregation, you know, that we had to minister to, um, and yet we were, still grieving. When you preach, preach faith <laughs> for 40 years and you uh, encourage families who have lost loved ones, you encourage families through tragedy, you encourage families through their difficulties. Uh, in the black church, 
you know, uh, the, the gospel and the good news and the comfort of the Word of God and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, you, you use that, you know, as a pastor, as a shepherd. When it hits you like it hit, hit me last year, it really pushes a reset button that will determine the fact that my life will never be the same. You know, what I went through and what my wife probably went through and the days that I, I couldn't move, the days I couldn't eat, the days that I was totally helpless, you know. When I think about this, I, I get kind of emotional, you know, because I think about what we have gone through. I cannot describe the, I hate this, as a Christian, call it a nightmare. But a year removed from all of that, now I am revisiting all of that. There's still so many people who are, um, who suffered from COVID, major losses. I know, especially in the black church, there were uh, many leaders that we lost. There were many black families who lost family members in the church. I'm preaching the gospel, I'm president of a seminary, training, and this hits me, you know, and my family? Why me? And the Lord allows us to ask those questions. But he'll, he'll also answer those questions too. He said, because you're mine. And um, um, I'm trying to say something to the world, to people like you, that I'm a God who even when a tragedy hits your life, I'm doing it for your good so that you might lift up my name and let the world know about a faith that uh, uh, looks on the bright side. I'm sad, but, and I'm not blaming God because she belonged to him and she's where she wants to be. And he left me here because he has a purpose for me. And so through all of this, all of this uh, pain and agony and so on and so forth, uh, my faith is greater than, than it has ever been. But that also comes out of the crucible of suffering that is tr tr traditional in the black church. And uh, uh, so we have to, uh, you know, we are the light of the world, we're the salt of the earth. And so this pandemic gives an opportunity for the Lord to showcase his grace and his mercy and his power of love in a very, uh, very, very dark time. The stories of loss and lonely goodbyes as a result of COVID-19 are the focus of a television and radio vaccine campaign from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Three Detroit area pastors are featured in the spots and they share their personal experiences with grief and offering reasons to get vaccinated against the virus. Here's a look at one of the television spots followed by my conversation with two of the pastors, Reverend Charles Williams II and Dr. John E. Duckworth. Some of the reasons why persons are hesitant, they don't know what's the long-term effects of the vaccine, they don't trust it. Given the history of the Tuskegee experiment, I also was hesitant. Then I began to do the research behind the vaccine. Do your homework, stay off of social media, and talk to your family members that already got the shot. We need to do this. We need to get vaccinated. There is no invincibility to COVID-19. If it hits you and it hits you wrong, you're gone. I want to start with the way that I have been greeting everybody right now, and that's just with the simple question, how are you doing? How are you managing uh, through all of this? And I know that for both of you, that's not just a personal question, it's also about uh, your churches, but, but I really would love for you to start with the personal and then get to, to how things uh, are going in your churches. Uh, so Reverend Williams, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, you know, I think the pandemic has taken a, quite a toll on us in, our, in terms of our mental capacity and, and then even just thinking about uh, the work that we do. Um, you know, I have walked families 
down the aisle at funeral homes where they were, you know, facing two caskets. Um, I have now uh, began to have to code uh, through the messages of what happened uh, and, and hear that there are individuals that are still dying because of COVID-19, but they have not vaccinated. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time uh, as a pastor uh, talking to the congregation uh, via a little red dot on the camera uh, versus getting the opportunity to hear that call and response that is so significant and so crucial uh, to the uh, aesthetic of the Black church. Dr. Duckworth, uh, tell us how you're doing and how things are going in your church. I have learned to embrace this situation and try to find out what lessons does the Lord want me to learn personally from this. Um, I have a set of uh, 10 and a half, almost 11 year old triplets. Mm -hmm. And so when this thing shut down, my home, my wife and I instantly became principals <laughs> and we opened up Duckworth Academy um, for the whole year. Uh, we had our children and, you know, we kept them here in the house. Uh, they've gone back into the building now only because they're going to middle school next year. So that was an adjustment. And then there was just a, the personal adjustment of how to navigate everything and try to keep things calm for them. Um, but also I've seen some red lines that gave me an opportunity to spend quality time with my family that I often did not get a chance to do because I was all so much out with everyone else and helping their family. So it gave me a perspective of taking care of home first, then going outward. Um, following that, the church, uh, it has been, as uh, Pastor Williams have said, it's been challenging to have loved ones, uh, those you've pastored for years and for them to lose loved ones to this pan during this pandemic to this virus and not be able to be there as we normally would sometimes i couldn't go to hospital sometimes i could even go to the funerals because the individuals may have passed from the virus and so i had to do some funerals from a cell phone i had to do some funerals do the eulogies via uh, uh zoom um and you know some grave site. Uh, so this has definitely stretched my ministry uh, as relates to things that I had never thought I would have to do. Um, but it has also opened up new challenges in ministry going forward. So I've tried to look at the positives and find the lessons in the midst of this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I also wonder whether you, either of you, um, you know, who've, who've been in this space for a long time, have ever experienced anything quite like it in terms of the impact on your congregation? No, absolutely not. There has never been a time like the time that we're experiencing in the midst of this pandemic of COVID-19. I mean, the greatest generation had war wars to deal with. Uh, you know, the baby boomer generation had Vietnam to deal with. Uh, our generation, Gen X, millennials, we're dealing with a pandemic uh, on top of maybe some of the racial upheaval around some of the civil rights issues of today, on top of uh, going through four years of a president that unsettled many people, not just in the country, but across the world. And so the time that we're in right now where we're seeing ecological challenges that we've never seen before, where New York is flooding, yeah. Detroit is flooding, and uh, you know, uh, water and drainage uh, supervisors and elected officials are saying we didn't, we, the system was never built to handle these types of things. I mean, the time that we're in right now, uh, which is I'm glad is, is a very timely question, is unlike anything that we have ever, I have ever. Uh, experienced in my lifetime. Uh, mm -hmm. Granted, I was born in 1980, and some may see, say, say that that's a pretty short time frame, uh, but quite honestly, in the last 40 years, this is nothing like I would have ever thought. Look, I grew up in a church where we had revivals, and we went to church every Sunday, and we had 
five day revivals. When I was going to church, we when I when I was coming up, we had five day revivals. Mm -hmm. uh, started on Monday, end on Friday, or started on Sunday night and ended on Friday. Uh, that's the experience that I grew up in the black church. I mean, now we have one minute, I mean, excuse me, one hour and 20 minute worship services and they're broadcast on Zoom and everybody's a televangelist. Something like I've never known or ever thought it would ever be before. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Duckworth, talk about uh, how this compares to anything else you've experienced. I've been in ministry for almost 40 years. Mm. And I, 39 years coming up on 39 years in um, January. Wow. And I have never experienced anything of this nature. Been pastoring 19 years, have never experienced anything of this nature um, uh, within the church. And as Pastor Williams has eloquently said, a lot of things that just blows our mind. But like I said, I, I'm learning to embrace it. And perhaps there were some things that, as a church, we needed to get rid of, mm. uh, and we were hoarders. And sometimes you have to just throw stuff out <laughs> and not push it to the side for later. And I think that uh, I, I, I do feel that, as he mentioned, all of us have become tele evangelists, whether we want to or not. Um, but then there's been the reach of various persons across the country, across uh, we have people tuning in our worship service from London and places of that nature. So I never would have even thought about reaching out in that capacity because I'm more concerned about home than I am abroad because I believe charity starts at home and then goes abroad. And so often in the missionary, if you will, world, mm -hmm. people want to save the world, but don't want to do anything in the hood. <laughs> and so I've taken the opposite perspective uh, of taking care of home first and then going outward. Uh, so, yes, this has been a very challenging time and the time I have never seen before in ministry. But the church always is able to adapt because my motto is when you are a prepared church, you adjust. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so uh, you both are involved in this PSA campaign to convince more people in our community uh, to, to, to get vaccinated. Um, and because, you know, I host a, a radio show in the mornings and, and, and a television show once a week, uh, I am hearing a lot from, you know, people in our community about how they feel about vaccination. So I know what you're up against. Uh, every day on the radio show, somebody calls and says, here's my reason, um, well, I'm just not going to do this. Uh, and, and too often, it, it, it's somebody who's African-American. So uh, I, I want both of you to talk about why it's important to, to be doing what you're doing in terms of this messaging, but, but also talk about the specific challenges you're seeing and feeling uh, with regard to getting people to, to, to do this, which is really the only way uh, to, to, to save us from, from this disease. So Dr. Duckworth, I'll, I'll start with you this time. Well, I will say it, it is very challenging um, and it's, it's, it hurts um, because I, I have loved ones. I have family members who, who are not vaccinated and I try to find out what's the reason why and I, and I try to share with them. You cannot let Wikipedia be the reason why you're not vaccinated. You cannot go off of something someone said. And I just try to drive home the point that if you get sick, and you end up with this with the virus, are you going to turn to the people on the internet who told you not to get the vaccine? Or are you going to turn to the medical field who you said you don't trust? And mm. so um, this is a matter of life and death because if we're not vaccinated and we don't protect ourselves, then we won't have to worry about a chip developing from the vaccine and tracking. And that's probably one of the most insane things I've heard um, from persons who don't want to be tracked, but then won't put down their cell phone. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I, I have nothing else to say. So yeah, it's, but I, I will continue to um, try to encourage people, uh, our people in particular, because again, charity begins at home, to the importance of getting um, vaccinated. I was proud to be a part of the PSA uh, and I'm still, you know, beating the drum, trying to convince people. I just met, had a conversation with my cousin this morning who lost a boyfriend 
to the virus. He was not vaccinated. She is vaccinated. Her ex-husband had a situation where he got the virus last year and he's dealing with uh, kidney failure and things of that nature in relation to having the virus. And so, you know, we're trying to reach our family members, trying to reach our loved ones um, to tell them the importance of being vaccinated. And, I, and I've even, people have come with the church angle and I'm like, listen, if you can trust God during this time where there was no vaccine, trust God with the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Reverend Williams, I, you know, I, I think most people who know you know of your deep commitment to civil rights, uh, all of the work that you've done over a long period of time uh, in, in that space. And it strikes me that there is a civil rights dimension uh, to this to this question, many of the things that uh, have played out in terms of the inequality uh, that African Americans have experienced in this country uh, since its founding are playing into the suspicion and the hesitancy uh, that African Americans have uh, about this vaccine. That's right, Stephen, and I've said it over and over again, and we'll repeat it that. There's no reason that I should not take the experiences of African Americans serious who may feel hesitancy because of the fact that this country does have a very checkered past on how it has treated Blacks in America. That's that's legitimate. Uh, what 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 I don't want to happen though is for us to utilize that past and not appreciate what's happening in the present. Mm -hmm. And the reality is is that Dr. Kizimikia Corbett who is an African-American virologist, who is a chemist, who is a scientist, who is now at Harvard University. She was at uh, the N National Institute of Health. She laid out the uh, plan on how to actually deal with this vaccine. And she's a sister who happens to go to Friendship Baptist Church, <laughs> who happens to be a member of the pastor Freddie Haynes Church, mm -hmm. uh, who is a, who also in his own right is a civil rights activist as well as a pastor. You know, that that means a lot to me, right? That means a lot to me as a black man, at least means a lot to me as someone who's engaged in the civil rights uh, movement or in civil rights movement work. I think what strikes me about where we are and what needs to happen most when I think about uh, why there's so much skepticism is that folks just need to hear plain speak. You know, one of the things that folks have stopped me in the streets and have said the most is, you know, Reverend, thank you for just breaking it down. Thank you for just saying it as it is. Thank you for just saying, if it hits you and it hits you wrong, you're gone. Mm -hmm. it, because some people just don't get it. Mm -hmm. And some people don't really understand it. You may be able to roll the dice. I told my congregation Sunday, you may be able to roll the dice and it might roll in your favor this time. But it's not there's no guarantee that that you will you will make it out of uh, getting exposed to COVID-19, you know. But what we do know is, is that if you have if you have the vaccine and you get COVID-19, that you'll catch a flu or you'll catch a cold or there'll be a little tussle, but you'll make it out. Mm -hmm. And that's what the numbers say. But I think that folks need to be just alerted to that. They need to be comforted in that. But they don't need their experiences dismissed at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, we don't know what's in the vaccine. But we got to remind people, just like you don't know what's in the vaccine, you don't know what's in the Fago Red Pop either. <laughs> just like you don't. I mean, we, we, we're, we're stepping in the same direction here. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that you're safe. We want to make sure that we protect our community. Now, the civil rights dimension of this or the economic equality uh, dimension of this, President Biden just came out just a couple of days ago and said, everybody who's working, you're going to take the vaccine. That's going to happen. OSHA is going to draft up the rules and those mandates will go out and investigators will start going to shops where there are more than 100 people working and they're going to make sure that people are vaccinated. That's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So now what happens to all of those who William Julius Wilson calls the underclass? Who, what happens to all of those who are underserved? What happens to all of those who are uh, mired in urban poverty and they're African-American? Where we're going to just create uh, tuberculosis sanitariums all over again. Instead, mm -hmm. we'll call them COVID-19 sanitariums where mm -hmm. you don't get a chance to go to the hospital. You just go to a place where they basically let COVID people to die. That's what I don't want to see. That's what I'm concerned. That's what keeps me up all, 
at night. What keeps me up at night is people dying unnecessarily and they don't have to die. Mm -hmm. What keeps me up at night is, is, is the divide that this country is really going to experience when this country becomes vaccinated in a way where that car will really mean something as it is starting to do now, right? I mean, they're starting to say, if you don't have a base, you can't go to a baseball game or you can't go to a basketball game or you can't go to a football game or you can't go, or for, for good, for, for God be it, when pastors start saying you got to bring your vaccination card. That, so that is gonna be another wedge just driven into this country where the haves and the have nots and the intelligent and maybe not the unintelligent or whatever you may wanna say, will not have the opportunity to enjoy this society in full. That's going to do it for our monthly report on the Black Church in Detroit. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And you can always follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, Impact at Home, UAW Solidarity Forever, and viewers like you. Thank you.